Thank you very much. Uh, it's a wonderful meeting and I really appreciate the effort um, the organizers have put in bringing together such an interesting group of people on such a relevant topic. <clears throat> the only thing I can say is perhaps um, you know, it would have been worth having this meeting even like 10 years ago or five years ago or one year ago, but, but it's great it's taking place now and I'm delighted to be part of it. Um, I also only received the paper very late uh, last night, so I would like to on the one hand comment on the paper itself, but also um, in preparing the comments I've been asked to do, I sort of collected a couple of more general comments on the topic um, of the causes um, of conflict. Now, most of my academic work is on the consequences of conflict. So um, on the one hand, you might think I'm in the wrong place. On the other hand, it was a really interesting exercise to go back to the literature, which of course I'm reading regularly and I'm following, um, and to also look at it from a sort of perspective of somebody who studies the effects of violence. You know, what does the origin of conflict have to do and what's the relevance of the origins of conflict for overcoming conflict and for overcoming the economic legacies of conflict. And one of my conclusions is actually very similar that you made earlier or just now um, saying that um, I think what is really interesting is not the onset of the war as in the flip from zero to one, but we need to study the zero much more. We need to understand the period before the so the first 50 war dead have occurred, and we need to even understand maybe the period before the first war dead has occurred. What is it that makes um, behavior first antisocial and then perhaps violent? And perhaps even more challenging, what is it that policy can do to shape that pathway towards possible conflict and veer society and its individuals back towards more peaceful behavior? And there is a very interesting sort of efforts out there by various practitioners, NGOs, donors, governments, to influence these pathways, um, but to date with very little success. And, and uh, having said that, the evidence base is not very strong yet. So that is sort of where I come from. That is what I work on. Um, so as a microeconomist, uh, looking at the causes of conflict. Now, um, first, my comments on the paper itself. Um, uh, as Ibrahim said, it has an excellent literature survey in it. Very nice to reread that, um, a, a great uh, refresher. And I also find it very helpful that it zooms in on this nexus between oil and horizontal inequality. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that oil is the only, you know, they, they make a case for oil being special. Um, I can think of some counter examples of countries where, where it wasn't only oil or where it wasn't oil, but um, okay, fair enough, that oil is an important uh, topic in its own right in many countries. And, and it is perhaps also true that the intersection of the topics of oil and conflict hasn't received enough attention, but perhaps more importantly, the, the question is, um, how does all that relate to behavior of groups? So we're going, we're starting to go beyond this um, country year, um, aggregated, uh, look at the world and, and starting to disaggregate and looking at groups and looking at group year variables, if I understand the data correctly. And that's very um, interesting. The, the authors have um, several interesting findings. They find that, uh, just to recap briefly, Horizontal inequality increases the likelihood that an ethnic group initiates an ethnic civil war in oil-rich countries only. Yeah? So clearly, if you are very oil-rich, that, um, that is special, that is different. Yeah? So we find systematic difference between the non or the less oil and more oil-rich countries. Um, and as military spending increases, horizontal inequality's effect weakens. And I understand it's work in progress, so perhaps um, you know, we can see more iterations of this work um, in the future. Um, those, are, those are sort of several interesting stylized facts which they derive, which we didn't necessarily know before so much. However, um, I have one or two sort of questions or comments um, at the conceptual level. Um, it, it, the paper sort of in passing sort of places ethnic groups at the heart of conflict, and I'm not sure how realistic that is. And we do see the important role of um, ethnic groups in several conflicts, both elsewhere in the world and in, in the MENA region. But is it really ethnic groups from the beginning to the end of the production function of conflict, if I can call it that? And I will challenge that in a moment in the second half of my comments in more detail. But just to fix the idea, um, does oil always necessarily exist where, where an ethnic group has its main base? Can you really align the maps so clearly as they sort of um, assume it can be done? Uh, some ethnic groups are very dispersed in space, or maybe you know, a minority ethnic group, maybe an elite um, in the country, you know, they may come from one part of the country, but once they're in power and government, they control the oil no matter where the oil is and where their own ethnic group uh, comes from. Um, I'm thinking of Syria, um, for example. Um, or, as in the case of Angola, what if the oil is offshore? Yeah? Then you may have an ethnic group controlling the oil, but it doesn't follow from the sort of spatial um, congruity. Um, also, um, later in the process, um, 
I, I'm not so convinced that it's always the ethnic group throughout the conflict that is sort of the driving fact. So um, we, we may want to look beyond mechanisms which have to do with ethnic identity, uh, which may help explain uh, uh, what happens. Um, the second thing is I'm not so sure about the data um, and how much trust, um, how much we can trust the data. Um, I used to be at CIPRI. CIPRI produces military uh, expenditure data. Um, military expenditure data is a bit like sausage. You can eat it, but you don't want to know what's in it. Um, so um, using military spending data for countries that are at conflict is a highly problematic issue thing to do. Um, I mean, just loosely speaking, um, it, think of any country that um, you know, is at war and, uh, or might be at war or has a high risk of war and think of where does the boundary of the military start and end. In many countries, the military is a large uh, economic sector and a large industrial entrepreneur. Um, and what does military spending really mean? It is often much easier measuring education or health spending uh, than to measure military spending. Um, I have a couple of technical comments, but maybe I'll give those to the authors. Um, uh, directly, what I would uh, two things I would like the authors to look at more if they rework the paper. One is sort of what are the mechanisms or what are the pathways um, that can help explain this. So they find something, they find something interesting, but why do they find that? I think that would require a bit more um, attention. And then what are the implications? So what does this mean? So what can we take away from this? That you should uh, leave the oil in the ground and not uh, take it out, or you know, and, and I think basically we're getting at um, governance issues, at institutional strength issues, but perhaps not just at political institutions, also at other forms of institutions which are shaped um, by group identity, or th this could be an endogenous thing. Um, institutions can shape groups, groups can shape uh, institutions, um, but also, of course, by the oil, wealth, and other um, government uh, resource spending patterns. Um, okay. So, um, very nice uh, paper, very helpful for kicking off the debate. Um, um, and, and I, um, but I want to place that briefly, if I have the time, <laughs> in a sort of more general comments that um, I, I prepared before I saw this paper. Um, so, wh why do we want to, why do we want to understand the causes of conflict? Now, on the one hand, it's worth understanding where conflict comes from. It's a, you know, for, for national identity, for history, for legal reasons, for you know. The cause of conflict is always very important. Um, uh, I'm German, in my country we spend a lot of time thinking about causes of conflict, um, but that's exposed. Isn't it much more important to understand causes of conflict ex ante before the conflict occurs? So let me just put it as a very tough challenge to the discipline to those like Nicholas who work in this um, even more deeply than I do. Um, isn't it the most important thing is to understand perhaps prediction, of using prediction of conflict as a test, as a practical test of the usefulness of the theories which are out there. And I know it's tough, and I know we're not there yet. People try it, but it doesn't really work yet. Why doesn't it work yet? In my hypothesis is that because while we know the main ingredients that you need in order to have a recipe for starting a conflict, we don't really know how to configure that yet. So if we were to construct a conflict, we would know what, to, what all the bits and bobs that we would need to put together, but we wouldn't know how to put together it yet. And let me just look at some of the sort of issues that are here. Uh, the circumstances, um, the motivation, um, the actual aims of the conflict actors or future conflict actors, the excuses they give, uh, the financial resources they have, the other resources they have, the non-financial resources, the leadership skills, um, the followers, the media, um, the whole mechanics. I mean, there's so many variables involved in a, in a conflict setting, and this uh, geopolitics, perhaps also. Yeah. So um, we have at least eight to ten variables that we need to consider in order to help explain why a particular conflict might arise or, 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 or did arise or not. And I think if you if you look at this production function of conflict, um, it is too early in the literature, perhaps, to really put it together meaningfully. So it's worth, like in this paper, to highlight particular issues. But very soon we start saying, well, but in those circumstances, in those, you know, in Africa it's different, on MENA it's different, on oil rich countries it's different. And very soon we start to compartmentalize until we have maybe one or two or three countries left, which um, each represent a sort of unique uh, uh, circumstances. Um, inequality, I think, is probably critical. In my own work, I've looked at inequality both before conflict and after. Vertical inequality as we know, doesn't seem to matter before inequality very much. Horizontal inequality, the equality between the groups and not the sort of genie style inequality is different um, and that might matter. 
in, in my work, I found that the vertical inequality is relevant in the post-war period. That's when it goes up. Yeah, that's when the guys who benefited from war, um, they can keep amassing their fortunes, whereas the people who lost out from the war uh, are stuck in a poverty trap. So vertical inequality can really matter in the, in the post-conflict period, but it doesn't seem to be a conflict trap. That, in turn, doesn't seem to make the next eruption of, of violence uh, more likely. In fact, the inequality reverts after a very long period of time back to the pre-war um, levels. Um, so what I think in, in this sort of configuring thing of different components of the production function of conflict, what matters most are institutions. And by that, I don't necessarily mean government and opposition and rebel leaders. I mean all types of institutions. And looking at this sort of early pre-conflict period, the period in which we see antisocial behavior and we see demonstrations, we see maybe electoral violence or, or other forms of protest turning ugly. And um, in that very early emerging forms of possible future mass violent conflict, um, the institutions that can help maintain peace and those that don't, or the institutions that even actively facilitate um, the escalation of conflict into a violent conflict, I think those matter. And if you want to put it a different way, what matters is fragility. And not just fragility at the state level, like whether a country is fragile or not, or whether a government is fragile or not, but fragility at all levels. What about the religious institutions? What about the local institutions? What about the market institutions? What about the neighborhood institutions? Yeah? So you can have in one street in, in a given country, um, which may or may not be fragile, you can have two people experiencing the local institutions and the state institutions very differently. Imagine on the one hand a successful ethnic majority trader who has a lot of resources and large social networks. He probably doesn't really mind whether the government is strong or weak. In fact, government weakness might be a profit opportunity, an arbitrage opportunity, because with his trading networks he may be able to counteract the market inefficiencies and the information asymmetries that exist. On the other hand, you have maybe, imagine a, a female-headed household, a landless laborers um, from the ethnic uh, minority um, uh, living in a, in a sort of shanty circumstances, you know, meters away from the, the other guy who's, uh, who's super successful. Yeah? These two people will experience all forms of institutions in that society very differently, from the formal all the way down to the extremely informal. And, and, and I think it's these institutions that matter to people's lives that shape the responses of actors um, to emerging opportunities for conflict or for peace. And if a op space opens up for conflict, it's these institutions that could help constrain that space or constrain the actors so not to invade in that space um, or even facilitate a movement towards that and an eruption of violence. And, um, and a dynamic, which um, in my view here we haven't quite seen captured yet, you know, the, the dynamic over time which can reinforce um, these patterns. So um, what I would say is very important is to, um, if we want to understand better causes of war and if we want to better sort of build up towards maybe being able to in the future uh, predict conflict at any one point in time, look at the emergence of pre-war antisocial behavior and how they can be shaped by institutions. And I just want to give a, a brief sort of case study, um, if you like, very, very informally um, of Syria where um, I had uh, the good fortune to visit um, in 2007. I've been asked by the German government to um, provide a study um, assessing uh, the capacities for economic reform in Syria and trying to strengthen the then reform efforts undergoing in Syria and within the Syrian government. And um, what I found was quite um, uh, sort of at, at multiple levels uh, sort of resonated with me. I'm, as I said, I'm German, I'm from West Germany, but um, coming to Damascus, I sort of felt a bit like thrown back to East German times, but without the travel restrictions. Yeah? And I had a very strong sense of deja vu that there was socialism um, without the wall, if you like. Yeah? Um, I visited the central uh, bank and I asked the central bank governor if I could see their library because I'm an academic economist and I'm curious to see what books they had. Yeah? They all had original Soviet textbooks. Yeah? So, um, I asked him what was the main achievement uh, of your tenure as central bank president. He said we put a cash machine in the entrance area of our building. Yeah? So those are purely anecdotal evidences, but clearly there was a capacity issue when it came to economic uh, policy. But the, perhaps the much more interesting story was, that, um, was the end of the oil. And I think that's been underappreciated, and it rel relates to the talk we heard. It's maybe not the existence of oil, it's the end of the oil that, in my view, is a, is a key driver of conflict. While you have oil, as we saw, you can spend it, whether you spend it on the military or whether you spend it on social um, issues yeah, to suppress or buy off your uh, constituents or, or otherwise, the people who you don't like either way. Um, what do you do if the oil ends? And that was sort of 
the message we tried to bring across in Syria in 2007, the oil, had, the wells have run dry. Yeah? There was no more oil left looking forward. Um, Syria at the time was exporting crude oil um, at a price uh, which was obviously quite low and then re-importing uh, the refined um, fuel products uh, at a much higher price, obviously, and then selling them to some of their key constituents at a price which was below the crude oil price which they earned when they sold it abroad in the first place. Yeah? You can imagine the fiscal situation that resulted from that. And um, the deal that Europe was offering the Assad regime at the time, um, I think, was laughable in, in exchange to the scale of the problems that the fiscal situation offered itself um, with the end of oil. Um, so basically, um, he, he had no way of satisfying the spoilers in his, uh, in his own government. And while I think none of us predicted uh, the eruption of violence at that scale, with the benefit of hindsight, um, you know, this was um, something that perhaps we should have seen um, at the time, um, given that a, a sort of a move towards a more European, more market-based economy, and if you think of the transfers that happened in, in Germany, for example, in order to stabilize East Germany, yeah, I said I had a deja vu when I came to Damascus, there's transfers that would have been necessary to stabilize the regime while moving to a more open market economy, um, more, more liberal regime uh, would have been huge and weren't simply on the table. Therefore, th there was no clear plan B, at least at the time. Um, so what I... I um, want to say here two things is that um, oil has st clearly has strong fiscal implications, but the end of oil may have even stronger fiscal implications. And the other thing that's important is to bear in mind the spoilers, that um, for post-war settlements we need to understand who were the key actors in the, in the eruption of violence and how do we accommodate them. And I think that will be the issue in all of the case countries we look at probably. Some, some people don't like that and some people don't appreciate the the sort of um, the continued existence of these um, of these spoilers, but um, but they're there and we cannot uh, ignore them. So maybe those were. I, I have more, but I think maybe that uh, <laughs> should be enough at this point. Thank you for your attention.